A very warm good morning to all. I, Bhashwati Bora, Assistant Professor, on behalf of NEF Law College, would like to extend my warm welcome to this August gathering in this virtual platform. This is the 12th Pragjuti International Dance Festival in association with KRF Foundation and Kalabot, and it gives us immense pride to be a part of this grand program. I would further, further like to welcome wholeheartedly all the participants, guests, dignitaries in this elite forum. Today we have amongst us Dr. Arshia Shethi, founder and my managing trustee, KRI Foundation, to deliver on the topic arts and the law, what they don't teach in art school or law school. I once again welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of NEF Law College. Now I would like to request Dr. Bhuvan Chandra Borwa, Principal, NEF Law College, to deliver the welcome speech. Over to thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bhatshati. Thank you. Uh, good morning to, very good morning to everyone. Our valued resource person, esteemed resource person, Dr. Arshia Sethi, art activist, founder and managing trustee, Cray Foundation. Uh, actually, uh, later on, we'll uh, definitely want to know that uh, what's the meaning of Cree. And uh, who draws issues on art and laws. The first time we have witnessed it's the combination of art and law, how law goes to art and how art goes to law, what is the combination of art and law. And uh, uh, my dear Dr. Anisha Mahanto, Festival Director, Satya Dance Practitioner, National Awardee, Sangeet Natak Academy, Jubo Award. She has performed extremely across, not only across the India, but in USA, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Malaya, and many countries. So he's the Founder Director of Kolpo, Kolpo. Uh, probably the meaning of the Kalpo is imagination, a society for the promotion of literature, art, culture, and social harmony. And my esteemed colleagues and beloved students, first of all, I extend you all to this, uh, uh, extend my welcome to this uh, digital platform. And uh, law, I, I according to my opinion, the rules of life should be the rules of law so this is the i think this is this is the nature nature this is the natural natural law and the human uh, we always say about human rights we always say about the human you know that uh, the moment we take place in the mothers in our mothers or oh, the law starts not uh, after the death, even after the death, law is to uh, law is to uh, law law is to protect our life, law is to promote our life. Now, uh, now after this COVID nineteen, we have realized that not only the, we are to protect the not only the human being, but we are to protect the nature. 
and if you want to protect the nature all nature means the all the plants all the trees all the leaves of the trees all the flowers should be protected wind should be protected all the sound of the nature should be protected all natures all kind of nature should be protected and and law is to catering the catering the changing needs of the time and this pandemic it becomes a turning point of human community so only this uh, art and law only this culture art literature social harmony can heal the evil things of the society now now the whole world is running after uh, it becomes uh, to be very frank it becomes so materialistic so we must be human being good human being and to be human being i think that uh, such type of program such type of program of art and culture literature should be initiated and i hope that our students they will definitely uh, benefited with the valued lecture of dr ashira sachi uh, once again i thanks a lot to dr annesa mohanto for giving us this kind of opportunity and already i have said that this this should be the beginning of new beginning and will be continued it will be associated with you in all times to come thank you very much thank you sir thank you for your kind words may i now request dr anvesha mohanto satriya dancer and scholar and the festival director to give a brief introduction about the program and introduce our guest for the session over to you ma'am good morning everyone thank you so much barwa sir and thank you so much madam bhaswati uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to share and also contributing towards uh, pragyoti international dance festival journey so uh, first and foremost i sincerely thank uh, especially uh, barwa sir for readily agreeing to host this session because our uh, team Uh, for readily agreeing to be a, a part of the journey of Pragyoti International Dance Festival, we have wonderful memories. As I said, mentioned uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have wonderful memories of uh, serve with uh, Tejpur edition, where we had a session in Tejpur Law College too. Uh, Pragyoti International Dance Festival was conceptualized to create a regular and harmonious platform towards celebrating multiple streams of dance traditions, and this was steered by Kalpa, a society for promotion of literature, art, culture, and social harmony. And today, with the support of artists and art lovers, here we are completing 12 years of our festival. The festival, with practitioners of diverse dance traditions of the world. invited from various parts of india and abroad has hopefully carved a niche in the cultural map of the country and earned approbation from the art cognoscenti as well as media in early editions artists from us uk germany russia canada bangladesh indonesia nepal poland ukraine france to name very few including our own brilliant young exponents of our country have participated Uh, along with the very talented local artists of Assam in few editions we have also endeavored to shape up this festival as a multi destination festival with its hibohagor edition majuli edition jorhat edition kaziranga and tejpur editions featuring the historical importance of the region through culture and uh, and promote the magnificence of the land so we do remember our editions where we had the entire festival in the hibodol premises uh, celebrating the magnificence of ahom dynasty we also hosted the festival in mahabhairav temple premises uh, in tejpur so similarly this uh, this attempt to promote the magnificence of the land has also been one of the goals of pragyoti international dance festival along with this 
performance traditions of Assam and Northeast for that matter, were presented in view of giving an international exposure. So we had a showcasing of Ojapali tradition, Dhepadhulia tradition, Bharikan tradition, Bordhulia tradition, Mukha Bhavna, to name again very few. Through this spirit of integration, the artists visiting Assam become uh, cultural ambassadors in featuring the greatness of the land and its rich heritage. In this way, we have been able to build a cultural bond and an emotional integration crossing the boundaries of India. Moreover, sessions and educational institutions as part of PIDF has been a very important component where we collaborated with institutions like IIT Gohati, Tejpur University, Gohati University, Dibrugar University, Assam Downtown University, Royal Global University, Tejpur Law College, Regional Institute of Science and Technology, Northeast Institute of Management, and Assam Institute of Management, and various schools like DPS, Sanskriti Gurukul, Assam Zatya Vidyalar, again to name very a few institutions, Vivekananda Vidyalar Majuli. Uh, so we have collaborated this, uh, our festival with these kind of institutions to create again a, a bridge of understanding interdisciplinary nature of subjects and various academic streams so that the social ecological surrounding of arts grow with new generation every time inviting innovation and uh, creativity in every stream. This year, keeping in view the COVID situation, we explored the possibilities of digital space in featuring various engaging discussions, online workshops, exclusive uh, premieres of web features of dance films, and of course, today's session on arts and law. And we feel really honored to have on board uh, celebrated artists and scholars of great eminence in each of these sessions. This year, we are indeed delighted to have with us four educational institutions as our associate partner, Department of Modern Indian Language and Literary Studies, Gohati University, Dr. Bhuben Hazurika Center for Studies in Performing Arts, Dibrugar University, Louis Kaur, Rudra State College of Music, and of course, NEF Law College as our associate partners. We are also very delighted that like earlier editions, Pre Foundation and Kalabod came forward with their collaborative support to Andevo, along with the support of Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And with this note, I welcome you all to the third day of the festival after having beautiful sessions in the last two days. This morning, we come towards the area of our rights and protection, the area of law and the interactive bridge between arts and law. But let us question ourselves, arts and the law, what they don't teach in art school or law school, as Dr. Ashia Sethi has titled her session. And to give an illustration on these thoughts, we have invited the eminent scholar uh, and, uh, and resource person, Dr. Arshia Sethi, twice a Fulbright Fellow, Dr. Arshia Sethi, established and manages the Cree Foundation, which braids arts, activism, and knowledge creation. Formerly dance critic for India's leading English Daily Times of India and presenter for four decades of a featured music and dance program on national TV, Doordarshan, she rose to advise Doordarshan. Author of popular and scholarly writings, co-editor and contributor to Dance Under the Sh uh, Shadow of the Nation, a Dance Studies Association international publication, she is launching an international academic journal on South Asian dance and its intersections. New areas of work include Indian dance globally and its intersection with the law. Pre Foundation has led the initiative to create unmute.help as a one point reference window on rights and responsibilities of the artists and art leaders. And with this note, I welcome you all once again and also to Dr. Sethi. And now I would like to leave the entire space to Dr. Sethi. 
Thank you so much, Anvesa. I'm deeply grateful to you, Dr. Barua and uh, Professor Bahaswati Barua of the NEF Law College for seeing the vision in bringing the arts and uh, law onto the same platform, even if it is a digital platform. I would like to throw in a word, give a shout out for Anvesa for the marvelous job that she has done in making this festival a multidimensional, multi-destination festival. She has definitely widened the access of Assam's arts to the rest of the world and brought arts from different parts of India and the world to this most beautiful land, a land I deeply love because it has been my show, the Bhumi. Eventually, there's always an autobiographical link if you look deep enough. And my link is that I have spent almost 20 years, uh, maybe more, yeah, about 25 years visiting Assam, living in Assam, researching here for my doctoral work. Uh, more about that on some other occasion, but today, uh, to take up from one of the points that uh, Dr. Barua said, uh, that he wanted to know what Cree stood for. So uh, K-R-I is how we spell it. It, it, it. It's not some abbreviations. It's Cree, the Sanskrit root of the verb to do. Uh, like Anvesa, I too am a driven person. And Cree Foundation leaps in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and the arts and the law was one field where we leapt in. Um, the tagline for Cree Foundation is linking for the arts. And we link different areas, different arts. And now increasingly, as my interest is moving more in that direction of academics, uh, disciplines like arts and the law. So this realization happened particularly during the COVID time when I was preparing a paper on a most marvelous judgment that I would draw your attention to as young people who are studying law. This was uh, the judgment given by um, Justice, um, what's his name? Uh, Justice Call of the Delhi High Court then, presently Justice Sanjay Kishan Call is on the Supreme Court of India. The judgment that he gave was in connection with the M.F. Hussain case. And I urge you to read it. Actually, it is mandatory reading, in my opinion, for all lawyers and all artists as well. And I would urge you to read this because it totally opens your eyes. Now, I have felt very long that the arts and the law are totally different in the way that they set themselves out to be. Let me give you a small example, a very mundane example. You see, I am dressed today in white. I am not a lawyer that I need to be dressed in black and white. I'm from the artistic field. Artists are ever creating rasa. Rasa is the wholeness of an experience which you savor. It is not real, but it's just suggestive. And I chose to wear this white because I knew that you all would be more comfortable with a whitish, blackish look rather than with some jazzy color. And so trying to create the ground in a way in which there would be greater acceptability from you all. I chose to wear this color. This is how an artist's mind thinks. And the way a legal mind thinks is again in a black and white manner in the written word. The artists are about emotions, not so much about written word. But instead of rambling like this, let me go to a PowerPoint that I have prepared for you, which will talk about all these points and will uh, lead you in a logical manner through what I intend saying. So I now cannot see you because I have the screen in front of me and I don't think I'm wise enough to know how to see you and the screen. So I will just take it that you are actually looking at the screen and you're fine and arts and the law, what they certainly don't teach in art school. Realize this in COVID period when I was writing the article I talked to you about, which was based on Sanjay Kishan, Justice Sanjay Kishan calls uh, judgment. It was about um, how M.F. Hussain was hounded for his artistic work. More about that later, but for the moment. At the same time, because all of us had moved onto the digital pl uh, platform, many unusual things were happening. Things like 
the performance would just blip out. You'd suddenly have a black screen. And no one realized that actually there was there had been a copyright hit. So copyright suddenly became an issue that came to the forefront. Along with it came issues like plagiarism. Now, plagiarism is very common in India. I know it's an uncomfortable truth to swallow and bear, but that is the fact that we take from each other without acknowledging, and that's all that you need to do. So once you were on this digital platform, thousands were watching you without your knowing who was watching you, and people were catching it when you were not giving them credit for taking from their scholarship. So plagiarism was an issue that came to the forefront. Contracts, suddenly with the lockdown, contracts didn't seem to have any meaning. In the first place, artists seldom have contracts. But the biggest contract that the artist had was with the government, where the government gives grants. The grants are given in a 75-25 proportion. In the first installment, 75 is given to create the work. And after the work is created, the remaining 25 is given. Often an artist puts in something from themselves also, so that uh, believing that they could earn it back in subsequent showings. But here all showings had stopped. The government did not give. Even today, there is a backlog of clearing the grant monies. So the question of uh, contracts came up. Along with it came up terms that are legalese, uh, force majeure, act of God. You may remember that in Parliament this word was used. It is an act of God. Okay, so these things started throwing issues a little bit into the foreground that till now, in the excitement of a full cultural calendar of performances, we were not concentrating on. Then came a sad entry on issues of arts and the law. And this was sexual harassment in the arts. Anvesa told you, describing me, activism. I could not stay quiet anymore. Something needed to be done. So immediately I started working on arts and the law. It took many forms. It took public lectures in multiple languages. It took the form of workshops. It took the form of training ethics and sexual harassment trainers about the unique aspects of the arts, just as they trained us in turn about how to unpack the issue. Uh, and finally, it resulted in this unmute.help, which Anvesa has already referred to. It's www.unmute.help, a one-point portal uh, in which we give you as much of law and the arts intersections in simple to understand language. You know, I really marvel uh, at uh, legal scholars, there are so many formal terms and all that, but they're not almost, uh, they're not all law or seeped in law. So uh, this is then uh, a portal you can go to to understand. And the range of topics we have covered in it already, it's an organic website, it keeps growing every, every week we update it. We include articles that we find anywhere that could help. You know, many artists travel overseas and perform. You know, there are special visa re requirements for performance artists. Tourism people cannot do arts and earn money overseas. So we've, you know, even written about things like that. What happens if your luggage, it, which may contain your sitar or something, gets lost? How do you claim? It's priceless. It's just priceless. Sometimes you've inherited that sitar from your guru and hundreds and thousands of hands have touched it. What happens to the sentimental value of it? Anyway, so these were some of the issues we brought forth in unmute.help. Um, I would urge you to go to unmute.help whenever you have a moment. Now, uh, let me again remind you about something that Justice Nariman, Fali Nariman, Oh, no, it's not Fali Nari, Rohinta Nariman, sorry. Justice Rohinta Nariman advised youngsters to do on the occasion of the conclusion of his tenure as a Supreme Court Justice. Now, I, I'm sure you follow the bench very carefully and you know that there are some law uh, judges who are absolutely brilliant. He was one of them. He always thought big and wide, spectrumal thinking, like a spectrum 
spectrum his thoughts could cover the cosmos. So he said, more you take things outside law, the more it helps you with law. It is with this as our uh, motto that we are starting today's conversation. For too long has everybody felt that the arts and the law are in a binarized relationship. Why do I say this? The arts tend to think about themselves as being more otherworldly, having a higher pursuit to which they are dedicated and uh, they want to extract themselves and they need to. They need to extract themselves from mundane matters of the world uh, to, to pursue their riyas, to pursue their practice, to pursue their learning and pursue their performance. You know that the Indian arts are not, not uh, uh, written arts. It's not that you can play a piece of music because it's written and so you just have to read it well enough and play it. No. Kalpa, the word, is a very critical word. Indian arts is about imagination. Now, your mind space is just that much. You can fill it up either with your artistic concerns or you can fill it up with law. So, so far, the arts and law have looked in different directions and have been themselves in a binarized relationship. That is why conversations like what we are doing today is, are very important uh, to bring arts and law onto the same page and in conversation with each other. And, you know, it's not that the two cannot meet. Of course they can meet. When two strong men stand face to face, though they come from different ends of the earth, said Rudyard Kipling in his ballad of the East and the West, which is better remembered for never the twain shall meet. No, they shall meet when strong men come face to face, uh, even if they come from different ends of the earth. So e the arts and the law can certainly be in conversation. And even if the first few conversations have to be a little forced, no problem. But they need to be in conversation in our times. It's not that it's a new idea I'm propounding. There has been a history of law in the arts. Unfortunately, the history is not a pleasant one. It is the introduction of colonial laws that were used in the arts before 1947. And I draw your attention particularly to six laws which are detailed here and which I will speak to you in uh, a little more detail in my following slides. Let's take the case of sedition, which you will see the sedition law of 1870 is the first one that we had listed. And this was introduced first in 1835, legally made into a criminal offense in 1870 amongst well-known people who um, have had the sedition law used against them. God, there's a spelling mistake here. Sorry, two spelling mistakes, Gandhi and Gokhale. And though the term sedition vanished technically, constitutionally, post-independence, but it remained under the Indian Penal Code as Section 124A. And I'm afraid lately we've been hearing a lot about Section 124A. It has been used extensively, not just against um, political protesters, but against artists and writers too. The little picture towards the end that you can see of the man in some anger pointing his finger at you is the singer S. Shivadas, popularly known as Kovan, who was arrested in 2015. This immediately suggests that there can be an element of protest in arts as well. So the governments of the land have been a little wary about the arts and that is why very often we find uh, sedition and such laws being used against the arts. In recent times, sedition has become a more dangerous legal concept as UAPA. Now, for 45 times, the poet Varavara Rao was charged for his seditious poems. Seditious poems? Who decides what is seditious and what is not? Now, we luckily, presently, he's out on medical bail uh, from a UAPA confinement, but he has to go up and appeal for the extension of the bail pretty much every fortnight. So, to go, going back to who decides what's seditious or not, I replicate a poem that he had written here. It's an excerpt from Reflection, a poem by Varavara Rao. I did not supply the explosives, nor the ideas for that matter. It was you who trod with iron heels upon the anthill, and from the trampled earth 
sprouted the ideas of vengeance. What is seditious about this poem? Who decides what is seditious? What are the parameters of sedition? Is it a joke that we just dish out sedition like parshad almost to people? Again, there are many who may not believe that what I'm the slide that I'm using in the next one is a slide that should be uh, considered at all because many people think comedy is not an art form. But Hasya is a rasa. It is one of the primary rasas, the primary eight rasas that were first enunciated. So using that as my liet motif, I enter into this small conversation. My conversations today are only to as a knock on the door, the door of your thoughts, of your mind. So we found that com um, com uh, comedian Munawar Faruqi was booked under several sections uh, of the Indian Penal Code. They gave the example that he was organizing. He was flouting COVID-19 uh, norms, but basically the objection was about the imagined content of his jokes. Why do I say imagined content of his jokes? Because leave everything aside but on the occasion of his arrest he was yet to begin his act so we have no idea what jokes were going to be employed so i think there is something we all need to consider now if i were to go back to the six law slide momentarily my next law is blasphemy and let me talk a little bit about the blasphemy law this is very interesting again it, as i said these are colonial laws it was inherited from the british colonial government after the punjab uprising and the repeal of the press act in 1920 that time muslims violently protested against a publication called rangila rasul Mm, you can make out from the name that it was a, a parody of the on the life of the prophet. In more recent times, this same blasphemy, and so you can see the connection why the blasphemy law was used then. In more recent times, it has been used for Wendy Doniger's book, The Hindus and Alternative History. The same article of 295A was what was feared in the case of Audrey Trushke's book about Aurangzeb, The Man and the Myth. These are rock solid scholars. They are not faffing. They are not talking lightly. They have facts, researched proof that they, they are making an argument. The way to tackle an intellectual uh, uh, project like a book is to be intellectual about it. James Lane's book. Uh, Jamie Lane's book on Shivaji, a Hindu king in Islamic India, is I think a brilliant analysis about um, the way in medieval India things operated. I met Jamie, uh, Jamie Lane in Minneapolis, where I was there for my second Fulbright. So, um, so um, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, um, he was startled. I mean, it was an academic work, its re rejoinder should have been academic, if anything, not legal like this. Anyway, I also want to bring your attention to the second photograph you see, the middle photograph. That's artist M.F. Hussain, who had a series of FIRs against him. And he was literally hounded out of the country. He left India, so he was in exile in Qatar. He left India's citizenship, became a Qatari citizen, and spent most of his life then in London or Qatar and didn't and never came back to India. What a shame that India's best known, internationally known artist uh, lost out on, on legal um, misadventures, I feel. So the last picture you see of the gentleman in the pink uh, dress is Perumal Murugan, who wrote the book One Part Woman. And he invited two attacks on him, two charges, obscenity and blasphemy that resulted in his announcing his own death on Facebook. Tell me, if this sort of a negative law environment is uh, continues, can one hope for the arts to flourish? So if you want the arts to flourish, and if you believe that the arts are a very essential part of your life, if you believe that they reflect who you are, that they are your, um, your DNA, your cultural DNA of antiquity, then you would be concerned about some of these issues. 
Let's look at the Dramatic Performance Act. Now, you know that whenever you have to do a program on a stage, you have to get permissions. You have to get excise and licensing permissions. Often the excise and licensing department is the same one. So it's called excise and licensing permission, but you are actually just applying for the licensing permission. You have to get police permission, uh, so, you know, and in each case, you have to submit a copy of your performance. So if it's a play, they have to submit a copy of the script. Now, this was being used uh, by the Dramatic Performance Act was seen as an attempt to control performance when theater was being used as a protest site uh, under colonial rule. But um yeah sorry just as a little aside on this for, because many of you come are from assam i must mention to you that you know uh, you have heard about bhavnas uh, you have heard about the concept of bharasariya bhavnas that's when multiple bhavnas are performed in the same um, sort of field and uh, in the past in history there is evidence of these occasions when a huge number of gatherings would happen for for the um, anti-colonial protesters to use these gatherings to have quick meetings or pass messages and instructions to each other protest uh, for protest activities. When the British realized that, uh, they banned Baharisariya Bhavnas. In fact, that particular Bhavna, I think it was 1922, uh, they set it on fire. So the attempt to control performance, believing that uh, subversiveness and performances often go together uh, is uh, something that has come from the colonial times. But unfortunately, we have carried on with it. We are still doing this licensing. We don't trust our artists that much. Whenever you need permissions, there are problematic areas. Then I'd like to draw your attention to the Indian Press Act. Now, this had many aspects. The Vernacular Press Act was 1878. The Indian Press Act, which included English, was passed in 1910. How did the Press Act come to be passed? Okay, this is the troublesome image that made the Press Act be passed. It is an image that came out from the, uh, uh, as a lithograph, from the press of Raja Ravi Varma. Uh, and in uh, the year was 1910 and very soon in December or 1911 maybe December 1911 the British colonial government the colonial government invoked the Indian Press Act and took away all the uh, copies of this uh, painting this image why because this is Mahisha Surmardhani as anyone from India can make out and tell you but the British did not understand India so well they felt that this image was representing calculating and they were anxious that there would be an uprising like the uprising of 1857 because the cow is a, ma a matter close to our hearts and things like that you see there is a there is the mahisha sur head absolutely at the bottom left corner and that was the one that they uh, were uh, considering was problematic so they banned this if you have not seen a Hindi movie called Rangrasya, I urge you to see that. It is about the life of Raja Ravi Varma. And suddenly when I watched it just during COVID times, I had missed it earlier, this painting of which I have known before, the history of this painting, I had, uh, it just suddenly fell into place because here they were uh, looking at the two demons as two butchers who have just, Kill the cow and the goddess has come to take revenge against them, which is not the reading as it is. So they use the Indian Press Act. Press, not as a newspaper press, but press as in any print uh, culture aspect. Then we had another uh, troublesome um, colonial law called the Criminal Tribes Act. It was rooted in the mutiny. In 1857, some of the tribal leaders had played a very significant a part. So gypsies, banjaras, banjaris, hijras, kanjars. Now, it's very important to recognize that hijras and kanjars are not, um, not uh, uh, tribal categories. They are performing communities. But they were all lumped up, our tribal uh, communities and performing communities were lumped, uh, lumped together and uh, they bore the tag of Criminal Tribes Act. This is the act that created in Indian law the category of the eunuch. Now, after independence, this was dissolved. Very good development. But guess what these 
tribes and communities were now called ex-criminal tribes, vimukt jati. What is this? You are still carrying the stigma of the previous labeling. This is what was happening. Uh, um, you know, every member of the tribe was to be re to register himself at the local police station. Their movements were curtailed. They needed permission to travel. So it was an anti-people's law guy, uh, disguised as a criminal tribes act. And in the process, many of the performances that were connected with tribes now denoted as criminal tribes came to an end and even today while the state is trying its best to get them uh, to have a revival but if you keep calling them vimukta jatis that the ones who have just been freed from the label of criminal tribes you continue to carry the residue of the stigma i draw your attention to another very strange act uh, and something we need to think about deeply in our times today when we are looking at public health issues. This is the Contonement Acts and Contagious Diseases Acts of 1864. In one stroke, all women performing in the public sphere were painted as prostitutes. It obfuscated the many categories and of skill in performance. So tawaifs, devdasis, deredar tawaifs, khadi mehfil ki tawaifs, betheki mehfil ki tawaifs, everybody was bunched together as one thing. You will notice that the colonial administration was unable to come to terms with the plurality and the categories and the diversity of Indian society and how it was organized. They were very keen always to have boxed order. By boxed orders, shove them into boxes that can be labeled as one and uh, put them there and line them up. And now maybe we can come to terms uh, with uh, and administer India better because we have categorized them. But that's not how India works. It is a master case study of plurality. Now, just to talk about using the example of contagious diseases, public health, because STDs were spreading, all women artists were put through this diminishing uh, process of being treated as criminals, subject to verbal abuse, interrogation, invasive, intimate physical tests to check out whether they, uh, they were sexually healthy, whether their reproductive organ, organs were healthy or not. The women were regularly invaded in as if examination were being conducted so that the British officers, the British uh, soldiers, the, you know, the colonial administration could remain healthy. What a terrible, terrible, invasion today you have for you have even given up a uh, rape um, a description as a two finger test or something like that and the verbal statement is considered uh, in the revised rape laws as the main reason then we have the madrasi uh, madras devdasi prevention and dedication act this actually passes in in post-colonial India, but it is in, in November 1947, so India has just become independent. But the process of the uh, Madras, uh, Madras Devdasi Prevention Dedication Prevention of Dedication Act started much earlier. Now, interestingly, I say, show you two sets of pictures. On the right, the single person is Dr. Muthulakshmi Reddy, a Padma Bhushan awardee. The nation realized that she was somebody very important. She was. She was one of the early doctors um, who became a doctor under very difficult circumstances. She was the she hailed from the lineage of the Devadasis. And you see an example of two pictures. They are not related, they are just suggestive pictures, representational pictures. But she also, starting from a public health position, uh, pushed for the Prevention of Dedication Act. And in the process, many, 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 many cultural property owners, namely the Devdasis, their property was intangible. It could not be measured as land acres or uh, you know, Khasra number, this, that, and all that. But they bore for generations traditional, um, traditionally, they bore cultural knowledge and they were minimized 
They have been kept away from the Indian performing arts scene and we have lost a lot of cultural value. That's so much for the past. Let me quickly now try to come to you to talk a little bit about the present situation. Now imagine a dance classroom and the rights of artists and art leaders. I presume that some of you have actually learned some art and so uh, this will not all be gobbledygook to you, but something you will understand. You will understand that in a classroom, you have the teacher, often called the guru, teaching and the students standing, sitting, learning. The guru, a teacher demands unquestioning and blind surrender. Trust me as I give you life hacks, performance hacks, uh, and believe me, in many cases, the students come and touch the feet of the guru, the teacher, and assert on a daily basis the hierarchy of the relationship. Now, the minute you allow power to come in, you also allow the possibility of the abuse of power. This oh. can be reflected in harassment, just general harassment, and in extreme cases, in sexual harassment. Why does this happen? Why can a guru think he can get away from it, away with this? And why do students accept this? Because the pathways for progress in, uh, in uh, the arts are very whimsical. Unlike, say, um, in the in the IAS, you first become an uh, undersecretary, then you become a uh, uh, director, then you become a deputy secretary, then a joint secretary, then an additional secretary, then the secretary. I mean, sort of there's a pathway, you know, that if you've done two years, you're in this position. If you've done four years, you're in this position. If you've done 30 years, you're 31 years, you're normally secretary level kind of a person and all that. But there is no such definitive path in the case of the arts. It's your own brilliance. So in the period of when you are not well known and you are still trying to make a position for yourself, your guru determines in a way your pathway. He puts you in touch with other people. He puts you in touch with the, in the performance that the school does. Will you be the first row dancer? Will you be the lead dancer? All of these are decisions that are made by the guru. So a certain process of favoritism comes. None of this is something that the law can deal with. It's a pity on many aspects of harassment the law cannot deal with. And yet I say, no, that's not true. The law can deal with many, many things. Which are those many, many things? Well, if the if in anger the guru makes a casteist slur, the law comes in automatically and you can make a thing. If they do something against the dignity, there is a, there is a peculiar sound that is coming. Uh, may I request whoever it is? Participant, please... Mute yourself, participants. You all mute yourself. Yeah, it's much better now. So, uh, so while for many things about harassment, there is no law that can come into place. Some things in harassment also can get contained in law. The thing to remember is that in abuse of power that has uh, colorations of sexual harassment or has uh, reflections of sexual harassment and they may not happen only in the case of the guru but anybody with power for instance bureaucrats are known to have misused their power and position critics are known to have misused their power and position patrons organizers it's common because once the entire art scene depended on your judgment the person who feudal lord who sort of um, supported your performance troupe or performances uh, and so you bowed down and allowed them their way that continues in a way, a way as a residue in the imagination then i urge you when you look at the sexual harassment situation to think about enablers those who are complicit by their silence ethical dilemmas and dichotomies are not only with reference to sexual harassment. In fact, I, I believe very strongly that if there is an atmosphere of non-ethical um, non -ethical behavior, which may be something small like, okay, will you just sign, put in a uh, false travel uh, taxi bill, uh, make a uh, sign a receipt for 
5,000 but accept only 1,000 at payment. Why should things like this happen? Other things also happen. And unfortunately in India, we are still in the process of victim blaming and shaming instead of listening to the new spirit of the law. Here the law is ahead of society. How can we bring society up to the law? It is by creating awareness. And whether or not you get a brief or as your CSR uh, or your, your social work as a institution, you can certainly help in creating awareness. Posh and other compliances, are they in place? You can ask anyone you're dealing with and you can turn around and say, this institution is very particular. We deal with people who have their compliances in place. Does your building have a fit, uh, finishing completion certificate? Does your building have a fire clearance? Has your building been checked by a structural uh, engineer and has been declared as safe? Do you have posh compliances in place? So, you know, you can make things happen. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, please don't blame yourself if you're not doing it. The government itself, the one that has made these rules, is failing in its duty to do this sort of thing. When we talk about a classroom, we have many other inside and outside issues that get related. Copyright, zero consciousness, zero consciousness of copyright how to, uh, you know, assert it, how to negotiate it, how to deal with it. You all are legal minds. May I urge you to think on these lines? Think, how can you make your knowledge democratic and widely dispensed? Plagiarism. Entire chapters are picked up in books. Entire theses are appropriated. This has to stop. It has to stop now with younger generation and their immense skills on a very democratic internet, social media place. Then there are some unethical practices. I told you about that, the signing of false bills. Then there are non-legal travesties, which are just not correct. Body shaming, indecent proposals, personal comments. You look very good in a sari. You've put on a lot of weight. Ever since you got married, there is a different look to you. What is this? Why are we saying this? What are you saying? People, you know, I must tell you this really funny story. Um, I had COVID around Christmas time. And my doctor, who knows me very well, he's a very good friend of mine. He turned around and told me, you know, I'm worried about you. You're 60 plus, you're diabetic and you're obese. The first day he said it, I was too dead gone to react. Second day he said it, I was just a little bit better, but I still didn't have enough energy. The third day he said, obese, I came down on him like a ton of bricks. I said, this is body shaming, you know, and uh, and it's not correct. And don't speak to any lady like this. He says, you know what, I'm a doctor and I'm using it medically. Apparently, medically, if you're 20% more than what your ideal weight should be at a particular time, you're obese. So that's the term they use. Maybe we need to expand our vocabulary a little bit or, you know, be a little more careful. When there is this whole large field of digital travesties, borderless, where is the jurisdiction beginning? Where is the jurisdiction ending? What am I meaning by digital travesties? Shooting pictures without permission. Morphing pictures. Nobody's going to give you permission for that. That is illegal to begin with. Sharing inappropriate content with each other. You know, the keeper, the maker, the sharer, the holder, the forwarder, everybody is, uh, is, um, everybody is under the law and there are consequences for this behavior for all roles. I want to draw your attention to other special categories and communities within the arts. Children artist, where we know that we have not just international conventions, but the strength of POXO. I will take a moment to talk about POXO in the end. We have LGBTQI communities. Um, 377 has non-criminalized everybody. They can come out, they can, and they form a very rich and important part of our um, 
artistic communities. Then there are artists living with disabilities and traumas. There are street artists who come under the Beggary Act, which is also a residue, by the way, of the Criminal Tribes Act. You know, when uh, we had the Commonwealth Games in India, there was not a beggar to be seen on the streets of Delhi. They'd been hounded out under the Beggary Act. But many of these supposed beggars are actually jugglers, nuts. These are performance communities. So they interact with the law in many ways. I want to take a moment to just discuss a little bit about the POXO Act. In the arts, we talk about catching them young. We have so many artists who run schools and 80% of their uh, student population is under 18. The minute you are under 18, you are covered and protected by the POXO Act. As a, in a quick dipstick, I was appalled to realize that no one in the arts was aware of the POXO Act and what their responsibilities were under, these, uh, uh, under this act and what the rights of the young children Artists are under this act. Now, the, as far as the act is concerned, another example where the, uh, where the law is way ahead of society. India seems to have the strongest legal framework, far stronger than UK, Sweden and Australia, countries known for their strong protection of children. Now, but according to a survey conducted in 2017, one in every two child is a victim of sexual abuse in India. In a majority of the cases, as everybody knows, the perpetrator is always somebody known to the child. That is why the child goes to the perpetrator in innocence and in trust. And such a perpetrator then abuses that trust. And the victim is a little hesitant in approaching authorities for redress. Often the child may have persuaded the parents, no, I want to go and learn dance or music or whatever. Unwillingly, the parents who would rather that they got some great marks and joined IIT or something like that, uh, uh, submit. And now can the child go back to the parent and say, I have been abused by my, uh, by my uh, guru? There is no consciousness about the POXO Act. And incidentally, since so much reference has been made to COVID-19, I want to tell you that the COVID-19 pandemic has only increased the number of children who have um, result, who have suffered uh, abuse. Uh, during this period, cybercrime raised its uh, ugly head, new and insidious forms uh, came to the forefront. And the studies all generate very low understanding about the POXO Act. For instance, it's a gender neutral act. So no, but no differentiation, girl, child, boy, child, no. All children under the age of 18 are covered. It also doesn't distinguish between the degree of punishment for male and female perpetrators. So a perpetrator is a perpetrator. He has no gender, just as a child is a child, no gender. Then not reporting abuse is an offense. Do you realize that? If you have seen it or if you know about it, that there has been uh, sexual harassment for some child or any kind of harassment for a child, if you, not being the perpetrator, do not tell it to the right authorities, then you are as well under the cloud. Very many people say, why, why is she telling now? Why didn't she tell immediately? Recently, some judgments have come like that because the judges are from the uh, society which is lagging behind the law. The skin-to-skin -skin judgment that I think all of you know about was disgusting. It was really shocking that somebody could say that. So in the same way, there is no limit. A child may gather the courage the next day. The child may gather the courage a year later, the child may never gather the courage. It is our responsibility to make sure that our children are informed that these protections exist, and that we stand with our child, whoever rings the bell for access to these protections. And this timelessness for reporting is a unique feature of the law in India, and we need to be very proud of it and salute those who were visionary enough to cast this law this way. Then there is, of course, maintaining the confidentiality of the victim's identity. And then this is very, very interesting. New obligations were introduced in 2020, by which any institution 
uh, housing children or dealing with children have to do a periodic, not one time, periodic police verification and background check of every employee that may come into contact with the child. Every guru must have this test done. Every, um, you know, administrative staff who may come in touch with the guru must have this test done, but it is not done. So how about taking this on as something that you can do? The child is innocent. The child is helpless unless we are there to help the child. So this is one of the reasons that I talked a lot about um, arts and the law, particularly arts and the child. And you know that there are actual laws that exist for children who are working in the arts and entertainment industry. They are the laws that come under the Factories Act of 1948, as well as the Child Labor Act of 1986. But it's, for instance, specific rules for child actors say that they're not supposed to work for more than three hours at a stretch and not more than 27 continuous days in a month. That means they're supposed to have breaks. The film company, because many such children are used in the film industry, um, have to ensure that the child doesn't suffer a break from school. In fact, they are supposed to employ a tutor who makes sure that in the free time the child is kept up to uh, no, up to track with their studies and their homework. They have to get permission from uh, the district magistrate about the list of child actors, their guardians who they have to pay for and keep in the same condition as the best of the artists. And uh, they have to have people dedicated from the uh, company side as well. And one very interesting thing, and I wonder why it's 21% of the fee has to go into the child's account. This is one of them. So basically, my effort to try and get the world to know about some of these rules, to get the artists to uh, know about uh, rights and responsibilities was in the form of this website called unmute.help because I realized and not just me, there are two other collaborators with me, Paramita Saha of Arts Forward and Somaba Bandupadhyaya of um, Shruti Performing Performance Group. All three of us, Somaba is also a lawyer, so that helps us a lot. We were convinced that we one-time interactions, regular work, even regular workshops don't help as much as they are very necessary, but they don't help as much as a fixed point where at leisure, anybody can go and get to know about it. And that is unmute.help. Now, I spoke about all of this with an artist scholar, somebody who has also performed in PIDF, uh, Professor Ananya Chatterjee, uh, and uh, about this and said, how much of this responsibility is ours as artists? And she says, you know, we are artists. We are not responsible for legislative shifts. Uh, that's not what we do. We make work. We do things that make people question. But the rest of the work is to uh, be done by others. Who are these others? Activists like myself, uh, legal scholars like yourself. So I urge you that it is time for us all to join hands and work together. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to take on any questions that you may have right now. I'm happy to see that the numbers have increased listening to this. I hope it spoke to you both at the level of the mind and at the level of the heart. Yes, thank you so much ma'am. Thank you for beautifully and systematically enlightening us about the topic and giving us an in-depth knowledge about the history of the colonial laws and making us understand the relationship between arts and the law. Uh, we have indeed come across so many new topics today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Can we move on to the question answer session, ma'am? So if there are no specific questions, then I have a question to ask, but you can please put it Yes, Abhik. Yes, Ma'am, ma I have a question for you. Ma'am, what according to you are certain discipline taken from art and culture can nourish the law field? I think that there is not enough uh, writing on um, 
arts and law with the sensitivity that the artist requires because they are unique perspectives. For example, one of the things I did not talk to you about is in the Guru Shishya Parampara, the Guru is a carrier of traditional knowledge. But because one of the questions has come on copyright also, so I'm just spurred by that. The question to ask is, can the guru assume a copyright position on that knowledge, which is traditional knowledge, which has which he or she has learned from his guru, and it has come piri that piri down, you know? So we need to understand the unique situations of the arts of India and make a new um, study on how these laws can be interpreted sensitively sensitively they cannot be verbose the writing cannot be verbose because the arts have a way of winning people's hearts the law about the arts also has to have a way of getting into people's minds easily so this is a whole new project that is ahead of us but needs to be done so when we, uh, when law schools say we have a department for um, uh, media law they are talking money only it's a corporate look at it. But the arts of India have uh, cannot happen alone and need an ensemble, but they're not corporate. They work with cooperation, but they are not corporate. So it's totally startling. You have to work with a sensitivity and a little recognition of what the art scene is all about. Even when I was working on the sexual harassment training with the professional trainer of sexual harassment and all, it was a two-way training. I was training her about the uniqueness about of Indian arts, and she was training me on, on sexual harassment laws, posh, how the ICC gets formed, how the IC reports, what is the annual training. There has to be an annual training on all this. And I really believe that one rag less in your repertoire doesn't make such a big loss. But you need to have the time to know your safety procedures as well. You know, so I hope you will do some writing in that line. I have one or two questions here, which Thank is very interesting and encouraging. Uh, copyright is one of the main legal issues involved in the field of artistry. Many uh, uh, artists who haven't taken any formal training or education are not aware of these issues that are related to plagiarism, copyright protection, copyright infring infringement. So what initiatives should we take in order to make them aware of such issues? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Barisha, for this question. Uh, it is a question that I was posed, and in turn, I posed back uh, to a very important crafts leader of the country. So, um, this was in Calcutta, and the art scene, the craft scene in Calcutta is very important. But the entire craft tradition is owned by a community. So, Ajrak uh, printers, or Swalkusi weavers, <clears throat> who does the copyright belong to in that case? Now we have GI uh, indicators. Maybe from amongst you, some new kind of label or some new kind of category of pride can be created and suggested. But immediately what I want to suggest to you is, please take it up as a project. Um, I'm sure Dr. Barua and uh, Bhaswati ji, uh, you set projects for your students to do like an, an, you know, this this term, this is your project that you have to do. Do encourage them to take up things like this because at yet there is no answer and understanding. Somebody who is an activist, who enjoys the field of crafts, who understands the issues, or wants to understand the issues can be given such a topic because we all need to progress and make some progress in the discipline, a real progress. It cannot happen if these uh, crafts people, normally non-privileged, poor, you know, they will never be able to do this activity on their own. They need to be having a trusted handholder who can guide them through the process. Why only the poor artist? I had Bikram Ghosh, you know Bikram Ghosh, the musician, come around and tell me, why is it that for one successful musical composition and Adele or Rihanna make millions of bucks and we don't even make 10,000 bucks 
out of our work. So it's not just the poor craftsperson or the poor folk artist who is uh, likely to be exploited. Artists in India. So maybe you could take this on, like I said, as a project. I want to propose to you, uh, again, Professor Varua, that uh, we should look at doing a seminar or a cross, you know, a round table on these issues so that we can come up with some concrete ideas and proposals. The initial movement will be very slow. I can guarantee that to you. But at some point of time, the tipping point will arrive very fast and you will see how there will be a consciousness in India which does not exist at this point of time about art and culture being intangible wealth that needs to be respected, valued and have a not just a, a, a balance but a value, a value that people can understand. So it's not that the poor people are the ones who are violating the laws. By the way, the mostly it is the it is the the richer people who are exploiting the artistry of the poorer people to make some money and not sharing it equally. The issue is very deep overseas because I I work a lot internationally also. I want to tell you that there is today questions being raised about the fact that rhythms are appropriated that even rhythms are appropriated then they get to be the base of some popular music that it's the top of the charts earns millions of dollars for some, from someone who has a good voice a good publicity and a good capacity to harpo somebody else's artistry so violating the law is often done by people with privilege a position and facilities. Barisha continues to ask, ma'am, should the artistic expression be restricted by any specific law or rule or should the artist be given the freedom to convey this message in the way they deem fit? So as part of the initiatives that when I started on arts and the law, when I was writing the MF Hussain paper um, and all these things happened and I began the public, public uh, talks, uh, public lectures, my fifth in the first series was a lecture in English by, by um, Akhil Sibyl. Akhil Sibyl is a brilliant young lawyer and he raised this question of is the right to freedom of expression an unrestrained right? Right? And his recommendation was it is to be restrained, it is restrained to the extent that it can cause social damage or tear up the fabric. But there should be ideally no restraint on any art, artistic work, because if you're not happy with any book, don't buy it. You don't like what an artist, uh, what an author is saying, don't buy it. But if you, if the state enters to shut up the voices of creative thinkers, that is a very dangerous and authoritarian trend. I tend to agree with um, Akhil's position. Mm -hmm. I would probably be a little more liberal than even Akhil is because I begin by saying that actually in principle, it is an unrestrained expression, but it should be self-governed so as not to threaten the fabric of society. So I am, whoever, I kept out the state and its legal arm. I've kept out in my definition. Whereas Akhil permitted it despite a fairly liberal position kind of a thing. So it, it actually depends on you. Now, really, Joe, all the poetry, Neil Darpan, the play, uh, this uh, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay's uh, work was protest. Everybody is protesting against something or the other. The Dalits protest today. In Assam, you're dealing with this whole genre of Mia poetry. It's protest poetry. It's poetry. I would love to read it. I would love to dance to it. I would love to sing it. But then maybe the Assam government would have issues with some of the topics that have been raised. So you have to do everything with... Uh, at least 
at least self-reflection. That's the least, even if you keep the law out. And if you allow the law in, you don't know when to stop it. So that's, but that's not how it works in, in, in societies because we are not ideal societies. So some via media has to be found and start thinking in these directions. Would you all, how would you like it? Does anything in this society upset you so much that you have to say it? If there is, then imagine that an artistic person has to say it even more urgently than you do. Otherwise, serve the state, serve the powers that be, serve the um, kya kehte hai, isko establishment. Artists are meant to be anti-establishment. Artists are meant to show a mirror to society. But if all the time you do wah, 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 then you're never going to come into conflict with the law. But if you're supposed to play your role, your dharma is to show the mirror and reflect society, to ask questions to society, to make it better, to push it towards progress. In that, you're going to upset some people. How much power do you want to give those some people? That power is what your law will contain. So, the rape law, for instance, got passed in Parliament. It is the new definition. It does not even accept penetration as a need. And anybody who says that penetration is a necessity in rape is not up to date with the law. So sometimes the law has to be ahead and society has to be pulled up to the progressiveness of the law. Where do you see, how do you see the natural progression of things? Is it to go backwards or is it to go forwards? You can control, can a river flow backwards? The river will always flow forward. You may turn around and say, ma'am, but then floods will happen. But I can remind you that maybe you can make your embankments a little stronger. Maybe you can avoid blocking unnecessarily through dams. All of these are questions about the Brahmaputra that we are dealing with today. Similarly, look at it like that. It is a pravah. It's a flow. Ideas are a flow. Law is at the end of it an idea. Arts also is an idea. The two should ideally walk together or closely encouraging each other to pass. Does anybody learn a form called Kathak or Hindustani music? Have you heard a term called Jugalbandi? It's described as a friendly competition. But to me, a Jugalbandi is actually a moment of excellence because one art plays something and challenges the other one to better it. So what are you seeing? Not just flow, but an upping, 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 upping of artistry. So maybe the law and the arts, instead of being in binarized positions, can walk together in a Jugalbandi. And that is my hope for which I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Let me see if there's any other question. Ma'am, ma good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, I hear a male voice speaking. Who I don't know who that is. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, how according to you, law can provide extra help in protecting the art and help art grow with time to time? So that question that somebody asked me about uh, Maliha, I will just come to you after this. Don't, don't. Uh, no problem, sir. So, uh, yeah, Prince, uh, somebody asked me this question about, uh, how, you know, about the folk artist and all that. And I say that I, I urge you to take it on as a project. Understand their concerns. Hear them. They will not tell you their problems on the first interactions. Interview is a trust gaining. First, you have to build trust. Then you start getting them speaking about their concerns. Sometimes they will talk about their main concern very indirectly and suddenly just in one word. You have to be sharp enough to pick that up. Then think of can, your, can the law, as you understand, uh, even nuance this issue. What are the law terms that can be used in it? In many cases, they... I find that they start talking about sections in law. But if you look at the bigger picture, you see it as a human rights abuse. When a 
a disabled artist or a differently abled artist is harassed, it is a human rights abuse because, you know, it's a double jeopardy for them. So you have to find the problem, precise problem, and deal with it. It's new thinking, new effort, new ways of looking at things. I have questions here from other people, but before I do, I will come to Maliha. Maliha, what is your question? Thank you so much, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, my question is, does copyright protection ensures protection against plagiarism? No. Plagiarism is about uh, uh, for um, academic pieces. So softwares today can help you catch plagiarism. And, you know, there is a software that helps you catch plagiarism very fast. And in many cases, you are supposed to self-declare that it is not plagiarism. Now, the thing is that you have to make sure that it operates. You know, one time you tell a PhD scholar that, Call the PhD so this has been caught in the plagiarism thing. And you make an example, for instance. Yes. Next time, not only will that scholar not do, yes. but others, nobody else will pick it up, will permit themselves that thing. So copyright and plagiarism are totally different. And I feel that copyright is more complicated than plagiarism is plagiarism mm -hmm. can happen at many levels again it, from tangible tangible in the sense you can see it at least the written word even the thought can be plagiarized yes sure. okay, so yeah. aapka bhi ho gaya. then i have koshiki i have a lovely big question from you and i have barisha's question still to answer so i'm going to begin by answering koshiki's question because she takes me into a totally different field in which even i don't have sufficient i don't have sufficient knowledge in any field but on this i have not done enough thought but there is need to now we have seen is a question that when it comes to dance mainly classical dance forms the society has standardized this form only towards the woman the male classical dancers are not acknowledged equally and are often prejudiced. So, ma'am, in what way can we change the mindset of society? That's a first question. And a second question is the transgender question. The transgender actors are often neglected in the Indian film industries and not offered movies enough, although they are talented. What is your opinion about such discrimination? I will go chronologically, taking the first question first. I'm speaking at a dance festival. So I may become very unpopular after I say this. But I think that you have already done one privileging. When India was born in 1947 as a free country, every person was as free as the next person. Okay. Then in 1950, we uh, concretize it via the constitution, which gives equal rights to equal people in your question you have not questioned the fact that classical dance is privileged it is not just standardized the question of standardization is a totally different question okay and that is also to me a little troublesome troublesome because when you have multiple plural voices, even satriya is not danced the same way in the satras. Every satra has a different way of dancing it. In the uh, Momaria satra groups, they use the mridang. In the other satras, they are using the kol. In some satras, for some dances, you use the dolak. So there is no standardization. And are you not deeply concerned and do you not question and filter through a legal mind the fact that Satriya has today two lives. It has the ritual life in the Satras and has a performance life on the stage for the same kind of work. There is no money in one case and there is a performance fee in the other. So that if you just take the case of arts and the law with Satras, and Satriya dance, you have many questions even in this. Of course, in Satriya also you see that the monk has been 
marginalized and the women dancers have been prominent made more prominent traditional knowledge has been marginalized and newer ways of presenting and learning are prioritized right now we talk about you so i have raised the question about I, does not the idea of a, an elitism in classical disturb you where is the democracy of india why is the folk artist made to walk on rajpath during the republic day parade at that evening the classical artist dances in rashtrapati bhavan so for one it is rashtrapati bhavan for the other it is the street i'm still not into the male female one which is your main question kaushiki you know and then of course what was it that by the madras devdasi prevention of dedication act you took out the traditional performing women suddenly the gender balance changes and the men of the same families become the natvunars right and who become the women dancers urban modern dancers who do not live the art as a lifestyle but engage with the art as in any uh, in any school for 3 hours 2 hours 5 days a week or something like that you know so we are losing our arts in many ways yes the entire male dancing tradition also has been given a lower category but mother india's children should have all been equal we all were made equal by the constitution so this processes of deequalizing protest a churning and a readjustment is part of the corrective process and yet every time somebody oh, protests you put a uapa on to them or you say sedition or you say blasphemy so the laws are all there to to make sure that the establishment and the prevailing systems continue unchecked so there are many issues involved in here laws of gender posh itna halla machaya about posh you know what posh is na prevention of sexual harassment at workplace act it doesn't talk about men it doesn't even talk about men who may identify as women at one level you have clear 377 but you never carry it to the to its logical end because of the logical end then you are saying that there are some people who identify who may not be born women or have the features of a woman's body but they identify as women but the posh doesn't acknowledge that also so somebody has to be activist tomorrow you will be in positions of power and decision making you will be able to force people to think you will argue cases where these points will be brought forth you will be the judges who will give sensitive judgments who will say that not like the skin to skin judge who sh shame the nation but you will give progressive judges uh, judgments which will push the law and its interpretation ahead of society and then you will pull up society to make it more fair just and equal transgender actors yes we have an insufficient transgender law but something is actually now beginning to happen on the transgender issue and when we did our talk on transgenders um in the bengali series that we ran kala ebam ain which is arts and the law in bengali we had transgender representation and i am continuing to work with that um transgender person the lady she um is uh, is on the committee so we can discuss things now if any of you is particularly interested in tra transgender issues uh, please stay in touch with us because then we can become a little uh, think tank separately 
Okay, so that's a lot of questions. I wonder if I've answered all of them. Uh, Barsha. And there's a last question from Atlanta Becca. There's a last okay. question from okay. Atlanta Becca. Ma'am, her question is, in your opinion, how do you think the society has changed the concept of sexual harassment from the past to the present in relating to the field of art and culture? This is the last question. In 2017, something very big happened in the world with reference to sexual harassment. There was a coming out, a hashtag Me Too, but the hashtag Me Too did not start in 2017 alone. In 2006 was the first hashtag Me Too that happened. But in 2017, it spread like wildfire. Once a wildfire spreads, it takes in many other areas into its chapet. So the wildfire started in the United States of India, uh, of America. My God, I wonder if this will ever happen. <laughs> and uh, then, but could India escape it? No. So the first city of India to respond to it was Chennai. And artists started speaking out. A list was formed. And on that list on social media, and the role of social media became very important, it moved around the world. I also saw that list. There was a list in academia also. So people started talking. Social media allows you to be anonymous to some extent. That's the first buzz. The second was, once a buzz begins, is somebody listening? Yes. In Chennai, some of the uh, leaders of cultural organizations heard this and they removed from their programming those artists who were being named, who were being called out. It had started a parallel discussion, led one of the leaders of those discussions was the scholar Dr. Swaran Malia Ganesh, happy to say a good friend and another Fulbright scholar. And she did some work, but it was 2018 and all of this stayed in the southern part of India. I write, write a little column called Soch in India's biggest dance portal, nartaki.com. And I started writing about sexual harassment. There was a lot of anger from my friends in the southern part of India because all examples that I gave were from the southern part of India. They said, why are you talking only about us? Why aren't you talking about other parts of India? As if we are the only people who have all these problems. No, they were not the only people. But I was waiting for those from other parts of India to come out. It took two years and a pandemic before the first such voice from the northward movement came. This was in Bhopal against allegations, not one, not two, but 19 allegations, 19 allegations against maestros of the Drupad style of music, the Gundecha brothers. The case is still on. Please follow it. The IC was set up. It was not in place earlier. Why not? You are recipients of government grants. Forget it. As per the law of the land, if you have nine people in your organization, you are supposed to have a posh in place, but no posh was in place. So they hurriedly put together a posh, falling victim to all the problems that posh ICCs fall victim to. Aunts and nieces and friends were members of the IC. That's not how an IC is supposed to be. The IC is supposed to pre-exist before the problem happens. The IC has to be formed in a particular manner. It has to have more women than men. It has to be led by a woman, not a um, namby pamby woman, but a strong woman who understands law, who understands gender. None of this was in place. Eventually, after some weeks, when such a strong IC was put into place, it ran its inquiry online. And within the time of three months, it came out with its report. 
it, that reports coming out coincided with the second wave of the pandemic. And before anybody could figure out what had happened, the alleged uh, accu accused moved court and now the matter is sub -judice. But there is still enough in the public domain for you to understand the case and for you to see how the legal system is being subverted to uh, protect the perpetrators and the predators. And look at the pictures available on the net and you will be surprised that society is more willing to accept the perpetrators and pre predators than 19 women who have complained. Think of what those 19 are going through. I work with them. And I tell you, it is a heartbreaking feeling even for me. So India needs you. India's arts need you. Don't only keep thinking about how to make more money and all that. If you can be of help to somebody, that is a very important and worthwhile reason to be given the gift of life. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are no more questions in the chat box. And here we come to the end of the question answer session. Uh, ma'am, uh, can I ask one more question, ma'am? Yes, yes, Varsha. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Um, pardon me, ma'am, if I'm wrong, but I have just a uh, question that, ma'am, uh, as far I have, uh, as I have seen that bhaunas of Assam, they are mostly performed by male. Um, even the female characters are also being performed by the males. So, ma'am, in this case, even in today's society, why the females are not being allowed to perform in the bhaunas? So, in the first place, that is how it was, but that's not how it is anymore. The modern institutions, like the National School of Drama, like Dan, uh, uh, you know, drama schools, their women are also playing the roles. Just like hundred years, not hundred, but seventy years ago at least, or um, women started entering Kathakali and started playing male roles in Kathakali. Once the makeup is on, can you make out who is a male, who is a female? You know which is the, is this character male or female? That's all you know. You don't know anything else. Same way with in Bhavanas, with Mukhas on and all that. It doesn't matter who plays the role. The thing is, are the girls and the boys being trained equally? As a gender person, my gender sensitization uh, may compels me to ask this question. Are yeah, girls and boys are trained yeah. equally so that they can be performing equal roles? But once Satriya was recognized also, by the way, as a, as a, a national dance of India, then uh, more and more women have started coming. And the, the same uh, way that I talked about um, the fact that monks were being marginalized, the thing to celebrate is more women are also dancing this form. But is the training the same? Are we dumbing and diluting the form? Because you feel that women are incapable of this training. This is my fear. There are some elements of the training that are very hard. Matiakharas are very hard. They are the exercise units. The Kosuka massage the foot kisad, the guru presses your back and makes it more su uh, supple. That is painful. So many gurus are not teaching matiakharas to girls. Why? They have soft bodies. No. Girls have hard spirits. You know? So let's... The question to ask really on, on gender is, are they being given the same training? Right? So thank you very much, Barisha. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, clearing all the questions of our students. And uh, it has uh, indeed benefited them in learning new concepts. And we look forward for such seminars and uh, panel discussions in the near future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank so, you. It's been a pleasure. Same here, ma'am. Uh, may I now uh, call Dr. Anvesha Mohanto to speak a few words? Thank you so much. After such an enriching and intense session, I'm left with no words. Uh, truly speechless. And actually, it's uh, I'm deeply moved and that the session 
has bridged so well the whole artistic sensitivity and also what we need to how do we care about how do we protect our artistic assets with uh, Rob. Thank you so much, Ba. And once again, I thank uh, uh, NEF Law College uh, for uh, your collaborating with us and uh, you know making this uh, uh, truly making this uh, shape this session so well. Um, I thank all the students for uh, your active participation. And at the same time, I would like to extend uh, uh, my invitation to all of you to join us online in all the sessions. So first day session is also available on our Kalpa Society YouTube channel, uh, where we discussed about interdisciplinarity and dance. Then we also have got to see how the masters, how the uh, celebrated dance personalities shared various perspectives of Krishna narratives through their dance forms. And then the second day, we had a wonderful session uh, of uh, Rasa Bevo. Some of the parts are available online uh, because that was an offline session. And then we had a beautiful evening of Destination Northeast. That fil those films are available only for uh, 24 hours. So to today at 6.30 p.m., those that link will be uh, expired. So I request you all to join us and see the films. I'm sure you will love all those films. And today, after completing this, we are having an online workshop at Debrugge University uh, uh, on dance writing. And then evening, we have another exclusive premiere of dance films, again curated by Dr. Arshia Sethi where we get where the thematic content is environment awareness and climatic change let's see how the artists as she has uh, you know spoken so beautifully how artists react to this you know various causes happening around our environment so let's see how the artists reacted to this particular cause of environment awareness and climatic change and tomorrow uh, with Gohati University, like we had, uh, we are having it here with NEF College, with Gohati University, a Department of Modern Indian Language and Literary Studies, we are having an exclusive online uh, viewing of documentaries uh, where we get to uh, see Bordelia tradition of Assam. We also get to see about uh, Pena and also a beautiful dance film, Rinalini, uh, which is dedicated to the legendary uh, dancer Minal Nisarabhai. So I'm sure you will all uh, love these field films and also get an opportunity to discuss about it with the filmmakers. So I extend a warm um, invitation to all of you to join us. Your active participation would be a great support to our endeavor. With this note, thank you once again and special thanks to Dr. Bhuvan Borasa. Uh, principal at New York College for readily agreeing and collaborating with the FDF. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for the invitation. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to be a part of this grand program. May I now call upon Mrs. Bonani Mohondo, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, to offer the vote of thanks. Thank you, Bhaswati. A very good day, one and all. I deem it a great privilege and honor to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. At the outset, I extend my heartiest gratitude to Kalpa for organizing the 12th Pragyoti International Dance Festival in association with Cree Foundation and Kalabol. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this enriching experience. My heart fills with gratitude and respect for our distinguished resource person, Dr. Arshia Sethi, founder and managing trustee of Cree Foundation, for not only sparing her invaluable time to grace this occasion, but also for enlightening us with her commendable speech. Thank you, ma'am, for enhancing our understanding pertaining to the confluence of art and law. I must mention a deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Anvesha Mahanta, festival director, Satriya dancer, and scholar for her immense support and cooperation. I thank Dr. Zakir Hussain, Director, NEF Group of Colleges, and Assistant Director, Mrs. Farhana Ahmed, for her unstinted support and guidance in all our endeavors. 
I must mention our deep sense of gratitude to Dr. Bhuban Chandra Borua, Principal, NEF Law College, for his words of encouragement. His able guidance has always encouraged us. I thank him for his kindness, interest, and continued support. I also wish to express my gratitude to Mrs. Bhaswati Bora, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, our coordinator for today's session. Last but not the least, I thank you, my esteemed colleagues, my beloved students, and the particip participants for your cooperation and patience in making this lecture session a resounding success. We thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's been a great pleasure. Finally, I leave you with this inspiring quote by Martin Luther King. An individual has not started living until he rises above the confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Once again, I thank Thank you, Mrs. Bonani Mohanta. So here we have come to the end of the session. I once again thank one and all for joining the session. Have a good day.